Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's episode of our medical podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nigar, and today we will delve into the intricate world of adrenal insufficiency, a condition that poses significant challenges in diagnosis and management. To guide us through this complex topic, we're honored to have Dr. Siva Shankari Mugilarasan, a distinguished consultant endocrinologist and physician joining from Malaysia. With an impressive 18 years of experience in the field, Dr. Siva Shankari brings with her a wealth of knowledge and expertise. She obtained her membership of the Royal College of Physicians in London in 2014 and subsequently completed a fellowship in endocrinology in 2018. With expertise spanning across various domains, including osteoporosis, pituitary, thyroid, adrenal, hypertension, obesity, and metabolic syndromes. Dr. Siva Shankari's participation promises to enrich our discussion today on this important topic. And throughout this episode, we will explore the causes of adrenal insufficiency, distinguishing between primary and secondary presentations, its clinical features, and discussing the optimal approaches to diagnosis and management. So without further delay, let's embark on this enlightening journey into the world of adrenal insufficiency with Dr. Sh Siva Shankari as our guide. Welcome, doctor. So thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Nika. Today, I will walk through uh, on the topic of adrenal insufficiency. As we know, the adrenal cortex produces a crucial hormone, which is called cortisol, which uh, helps to regulate stress in our body. During acute stress situation, the body goes through a tremendous stress causing physical and emotional stress. So in these conditions, patients need the help of hormone cortisol to regulate uh, the need to maintain the blood pressure, blood sugar, and the electrolytes. So uh, we call adrenal insufficiency when there is a failure of glucocorticoid uh, hormone or the mineral corticoid produced by adrenal cortex to meet the body's requirement. The onset is usually gradual. However, in some cases, the patient can present as an acute Addisonian crisis. And these presentations are variable according to the extent of adrenal failure and the degree of stress. The causes of uh, adrenal insufficiency mainly can be, uh, you know, uh, can be either primary or secondary. So the primary adrenal insufficiency manifests as a result of destruction of the adrenal gland, which can be caused by an infection such as TB or fungal, or uh, autoimmune cause such as autoimmune adrenalysis, hemorrhage, or malignancy. The malignancy could be a primary malignancy or a metastasis to the adrenal gland. The secondary adrenal insufficiency, uh, which is a cause uh, due to a pituitary gland tumor, surgery or radiation to the brain. And other causes for the adrenal insufficiency, secondary adrenal insufficiency is uh, exogenous steroid intake. Whereas the tertiary adrenal insufficiency is due to the cessation of exogenous steroid or due to um, uh, insult to the hypothalamus. So the symptoms are usually non-specific. Patients come with tiredness, muscle cramps, reduce in appetite and weight loss. They can also have some uh, gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, vomiting and abdominal pain. Besides that, some patients may even have postural giddiness due to the hypotension that was uh, uh, due to the hypotension. And in these patients with hypoadrenalism, there is also a presence of hyponatremia, which causes salt craving. And in some patients with primary adrenal insufficiency, there are specific symptoms to delineate from the secondary cause. So these patients have skin hyperpigmentation over the extensor surfaces, sun-exposed area or oral mucosa. Besides that, 
Other patients could have vitiligo, oral candidiasis, and in some women, there could be even reduced axillary and pubic hair or libido. Thank you so much, Dr. Siva Shankari, for giving us a brief introduction to adrenal insufficiency um, and also uh, providing us on the variations between primary and secondary forms of adrenal sufficiency. This will definitely um, he help the clinicians in prompt diagnosis and targeted management. Now, moving on to our next question, could you please walk us through the diagnostic process for adrenal insufficiency, including the key laboratory tests and the imaging studies? Yeah, so the diagnosis of uh, adrenal insufficiency involves three stages. So the first stage is demonstrating inappropriately low serum cortisol secretion. Second stage would be determining between the primary and secondary causes and also evaluating the need for mineralocorticoid uh, replacement. And the third stage would be seeking a treatable cause for the primary disorder. However, in acute setting, when the patient comes with a Edisonian crisis, we should not waste any time and delay the institution of treatment uh, just for the sake of diagnosis. So how do we uh, confirm a low uh, cortisol level? So we do a early morning cortisol at 8 a.m. in a fasting uh, state. So the patients, uh, usually uh, we have the uh, cortisol hormone secreted in a diurnal variation with highest level early in the morning upon waking and the lowest during the night. So we would like to uh, check the cortisol, which is the highest in the morning. And we are also, uh, we would also find that in adrenal insufficiency, there is a biochemical imbalance whereby there is hyponatremia, hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis. To delineate between the primary and secondary cause, we do a ACTH, which is an adrenocorticotropin hormone. So in primary uh, adrenal insufficiency, there is an increased or high level of ACTH, whereas in secondary cause, the ACTH is suppressed. During the second stage, we do a confirmatory test, which is called the ACTH stimulation test or the synectin, short synectin test. So um, we could also do some other extra tests such as a renin, which could be increased in primary uh, adrenal insufficiency, as well as a 21 hydroxylase antibody, which, could, which is positive in primary adrenal insufficiency. So, as I mentioned earlier, cortisol is secreted in a diurnal variation and it's highly bound to uh, the binding globulin. So, before we uh, measure the cortisol level, we should make sure that the patient is not on any uh, estrogen supplement or other patient having other conditions like nephrotic syndrome or liver failure. In normal subjects, the normal morning uh, serum cortisol is usually ranging from 10 to 20 microgram per deciliter, which is about 275 to 555 nanomole per liter. And levels below 140 is highly suggestive of adrenal insufficiency. However, just the early morning cortisol alone is not reliable to predict a deficiency in the adrenal gland. So we, to conclude, we do a short synectin test. So short synectin is actually not affected by a diurnal variation and the standard dose that is given is 250 microgram of synthetic ACTH as a IV bolus and we repeat the cortisol levels at 30 minutes and 60 minutes after the ACTH. So in normal response, the cortisol should go beyond 500 nanomole uh, at 30 or 60 minutes. A range between 500 to 550 is acceptable between different assays. So this is a diagram to show that uh, the difference between the primary adrenal insufficiency and secondary adrenal insufficiency. So in primary adrenal insufficiency, the ACTH is high, even up to 880 picomole per liter, and the aldosterone is low and the renin is high. 
whereas in secondary cause the ACDH is low with a normal aldosterone and renin level. And mineral corticoid deficiency sometimes can occur in secondary adrenal insufficiency due to prolonged ACTH deficiency. So after we confirm the adrenal insufficiency and when we are looking for uh, the causes for the primary, so we need to do a CT adrenal to look for any tumor infection or any hemorrhage. So if let's say the patient is having an infection or a malignancy, then there will be calcification and central necrosis of the adrenal gland. In, in cases of uh, metastasis, we should do a FDG PET scan to look for primary source. And there are also other rarer causes for the adrenal insufficiency, which is related to endocrine, such as polyglandular syndrome. So we have three types of polyglandular syndrome, and it is also associated with other types of autoimmune conditions like type 1 diabetes, premature ovarian failure, and autoimmune thyroiditis. And uh, in some of the in one of the conditions, so patient would also have. Um, uh, mucocutaneous uh, candidiasis, which starts from adolescence. Other rare conditions of uh, adrenal insufficiency includes critical illness-induced corticosteroid de uh, insufficiency. In, in cases of acute shock, when patients are given volume expanders and um, uh, vasopressors and the BP that does not go up, then we should think about adrenal insufficiency. So these patients should be given IV hydrocortisone 200 milligrams uh, per day. So we can give a 100 uh, milligram stat and a 200 milligram per day on the first day and we taper down to 100 milligram uh, per day on the second day and, uh, and we assess the patients. Whereas in patients who are uh, chronically uh, ill, uh, critically ill uh, for several weeks in the ICU, they are bound to also have um, uh, adrenal ins uh, insufficiency. So in these patients, we could give a dose of uh, 60 milligram in a day. And to conclude, uh, Critic, uh, critical illness uh, induced corticosteroid insufficiency, a synectin test could be done. And when there is, um, a, and in these cases, the cortisol level does not go beyond 9 microgram per liter or 250 nanomole per liter after the ACTH infusion. Now, coming to our final subtopic on our topic. What are the key considerations for managing adrenal insufficiency in terms of medication, lifestyle adjustments, and potential complications? So as I mentioned earlier, we have covered uh, acute management of uh, adrenal crisis whereby we cover the patient with IV hydrocortisone. So let's look at the treatment for patients who are more stable and come with the adrenal insufficiency. So in these patients, glucocorticoid of choice is hydrocortisone, which is given about 10 to 15 milligram per uh, body surface area, which comes to about 15 to 25 milligrams in a day, or cortisone acetate in the dose of 20 to 35 milligrams in two to three divided doses per day. So usually we give at a dose of 10 milligrams in the morning, and another five milligrams in the afternoon around two o'clock and another five milligrams in the evening about 6 a.m. So the first dose is usually higher than the rest of the day because you need the energy to uh, start your day and usually it's taken just upon waking up. Other options include prednisolone at the dose of three to five milligrams in a day uh, which can be given in patients who are non-compliant to the multiple doses or during the fasting month where it, uh, it is uh, easier for the patient to take once a day medication. However, we don't recommend using dexamethasone as a replacement therapy due to increased risk of pushing white side effect. 
the principles of corticosteroid replacement should be uh, a, a, a replacement of hormone which mimics the endogenous cortisol rhythm with a peak at morning prior to awakening and a nadir at bedtime. And it should also have a little inter-individual variability so that correct dose can be predicted. And it should be something easy to titrate and monitor and also to reduce the uh, risk of overtreatment. So usually the key is using lowest possible dose to relieve the symptoms of glucocorticoid deficiency without causing Cushing syndrome. In patients with primary adrenal insufficiency, mineral corticoid replacement is advised mainly to prevent hyponatremia, hyperkalemia and dehydration. A dose of oral fluorocortisone at 0.1 mg a day or a half dose of 0.05 mg a day when the patient is also on hydrocortisone is recommended. And in these patients, if antihypertensive need to be used, diuretics and spironolactones should be avoided as they counteract the effects of fluorocortisone. And in secondary adrenal insufficiency, mineral corticoids are rarely uh, needed. So in secondary adrenal insufficiency, as I mentioned earlier, is, which is due to a pituitary tumor, the assessment should be also made to uh, look for uh, a deficiency in other hormones. Because we know that in, in secondary adrenal insufficiency, we know that the pituitary gland uh, produces several other hormones like the gonadal hormones, uh, ACTH, thyroid, TSH hormone, and prolactin. So we should uh, we should screen for all the uh, anterior pituitary hormones when we are considering a secondary um, adrenal insufficiency. And the second thing to note is we should always replace the cortisol first before replacing the thyroid hormone. This is to uh, prevent an adrenal crisis. Thank you so much, Dr. Siva Shankari, for joining us today and sharing your valuable expertise on the crucial topic of adrenal insufficiency. Your presentation on the diagnostic methods and management strategies especially have been incredibly enlightening and very informative. We're truly grateful for your participation and willingness to shed light on this important topic. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Nigar, for the opportunity. Thank you so much once again, doctor. And we're looking forward to having you on our next sessions together. And to our listeners, we would like to thank you for joining us on this insightful journey into adrenal insufficiency. We hope you found today's episode informative and engaging. Stay tuned for more enriching conversations in the future. Thank you and goodbye.